the man himself. Daniel, hola. Doctor, hola, Dr. Mike. How are you doing, man? Good, good. So nice to see you once again. Likewise, likewise, man. How you been? I've, I've seen your last competition photographs and on all your <laughs> bodybuilding journey. I wanted to ask you, man, how did you feel with the results, with your process, before digging into the topic at hand? Mm. Feel about what? About your competition, your placing, the way you do bodybuilding now. Mm. <laughs> uh, I thought my placing was accurate. Well judged. Um, I was not excited about the placing. Yeah. Uh, and I think I uh, have a hypothesis of how I can improve the process uh, to, to get a better competition placing. Can you let us know a little bit that hypothesis? Sure, for sure. Because, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but as far as I know, it has to do with your water retention and stuff like that, right? Because massing for you, for as long as I've known, I've met you, it's not really a problem, right? It's more so the peaking process. Mm. Yeah. The peaking process is definitely something that can be done better. But uh, I think that a place where the water retention might stem from is that's my response to having very high stress levels, like high cortisol levels, basically. Right. And and um, because those high stress levels result in a high level of body water, it becomes very difficult for me to tell uh, if I'm, how lean I actually am. So for many preps now, as I get leaner, I also start to accumulate body water and it becomes very, very difficult to tell how lean I actually am. And so guiding in the process to get as lean as necessary is very, very difficult. But I think the reason that I have been um, holding so much water is the stress. And I think it's time for me to try to reduce the stress substantially. And, and that means reducing the size of the caloric deficit and instead of just flattening out, doing periods of um, filling up and flattening out, filling up, flattening out, which is a lot of people do anyway. Um, and then that way I'll be able to have lower stress and have better results and simultaneously be able to tell after every fill up period what I actually look like. Um, and then I'll be able to hopefully uh, see myself getting into good shape uh, as I lean out and then be able to tell when I'm in sufficiently good shape to step on stage and then uh, not have a big body water problem to get rid of. So that's... Yeah, yeah. because there's so much variables that go into a bodybuilding uh, prep that we don't often take into consideration and stress for sure is a big one so if i contributed a little bit to that stress you know i'm sure you get tons of requests like mine to do live streams to do podcasts to do this that 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 for sure adds up man so that's why i'm always <laughs> super super thankful for your time and also very respectful for it oh my god so, it's not a stress at all man nah but i know it's because time management and and all in between, it, it can get a little bit tough. And, and also that you travel all around the world talking about hypertrophy, which sure is it is the, the one thing we love the most, but it adds up, man. man. I totally get that component. Mm. Yeah, well, Very we'll, we'll see if it works. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will. It's trial and error. And with all the background knowledge on your team, uh, with Jared and everyone else, I'm sure you'll you'll place better next time, man. Do you have any mm. um, any upcoming 
events that you're planning? Are you going to go into a longer off season? Uh, I'm in an off season now, and I'm probably going to do a mock contest prep with no contest that ends in December. And I'm going to start that like October 1st. Right. Um, so maybe like a 10 or 11 week prep just to test out the hypothesis of these kinds of manipulations. And if that looks really good, then I will finish that and then do a short off season and then begin next year's prep sometime around March uh, so that I can peak for some shows in July and then uh, some shows in September, and maybe even November. So I'll probably compete a few times next year. That's pretty cool, man. Something came to mind, just one more thing before digging into the topic. Uh, in regards to stress management, I had a conversation a while back with, it was both Lauren Conlin and also Dr. Eric Drexler. Uh, meditation and stress management, have you tried maybe the strategy do you think can help you? Yeah, I meditate all the time. Oh, really? What kind of meditation do you do, Dr. Mark? A vipassana meditation, just following the breath. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool because that's one topic that gets a little... I don't know, in the Western world, kind of a hippie reputation. I don't know how to put it into words, but it's pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah, you put it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much more like a hippie practice, but it's super interesting, and I also do it. I have my, my app in the phone for meditation and all that stuff, and I think mm. it can help you more than it already does. So anyway, right to the topic at hand. I wanted to ask you specifically about this topic because, like I, I, I already mentioned you in, in a in our conversation on Instagram. I talk about this stuff with Milo Wolf and also with, with Dr. Eric Helms. So of course I needed to ask the man, the full wrong man himself about all this research. And most importantly, I think for me and for the audience listening, what has changed in regards to your views on full wrong? Because just as a segue for you, I know full wrong, like a, let's say a, a brand, a branding, it's not really ideology. I know that it comes from just showing the bros at the gym that hey, there's something interesting going down there in the squat that you should perhaps aim for, not as a way of saying I am full room. You know, I'm not. I don't. I don't I'm not sure if I'm being clear about that. But I wanted to start with that. Why the full room on itself, the name full room, and digging into the research on length and partials, and more importantly, what has changed for you. Why the name Full Rom? I, I forget why we came up with that. Um, uh, full range of motion is the default assumption of how you should be training when you have only theoretical assumptions and don't have much research directly to back up things. So if you think about how muscle functions, how motor units are recruited, how tension is supplied and how growth happens, you think, okay, um, if I want full muscular development, taking the muscle through its full range of motion seems at least uh, a priori decent assumption to make. And, and there's some convincing literature on the fact that some motor units are only very active at some portions, par, or portions of the range of motion. That helps that. Another thing is that if you use a more full range of motion, you have to use less load externally, and that reduces joint stress. Another one is that by going through a full range of motion, you, you don't have any weak points to expose. So if you slip up in your technique, nothing bad happens. If you're squatting to partial, but then you go a little lower than you're supposed to, you're just really not used to that part of the range of motion. You could get very, very hurt because you're unaccustomed to it. Another part is that um, we've been, myself and some friends of mine, have been training with a relatively full range of motion for a long time. And we also have been training a long time with partial ranges of motion. And generally, the full range of motion training has led to uh, less fatigue perception for us, a bigger perception of stimulus. 
seemingly better results and way fewer injuries. So, uh, uh, yeah. So that's how we got into the full range of motion situation. And, and so what my philosophical position on the matter has been for a long time is that full range of motion is the default hypothesis of how you should train pending any good reasoning to modify that. And the recent literature on length and partials has given us some good reason to modify that. So that's my position on sort of where the full range of motion assumption comes from. Yeah, for sure, because when we often think about full range of motion, so, sorry, versus partials, we think about the shortening of the muscle. Um, I don't know, let's say bicep curls, we think about the full range, and then as partial ranges, we tend to think about this little portion. So I think it's really important to clarify that we, when we talk about partial ranges of motion, we're talking about, let's say, a preacher curl, the full lengthening, and perhaps up to that point. So it's really important to have that in mind, because when I first encountered this research through the mass research review, uh, I thought it was going to be like some sort of fad, like, did I read this right? Am I getting this correctly? And the more research and the more research that, that comes out, and also the, the made analysis by Milo, which, funny enough, uh, he used to work with you guys, sir. Or I don't know if he still does in, in yeah, RP Strength. Say that again? Did Milo used to work with you guys in RP Strength, Milo mm -hmm. Wolf? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that yeah. funny because when Full Ram, full Ram I'm sorry, and then he's kind of the, the poster boy for length and partials. So anyway, just a brief comment. I want to, to discuss with you, what is your take on this research? Because I know it's not in all muscle groups, groups that has been studied. Also, the meta analysis it's limited by itself, and also the way that hypertrophy is directly measured. And digging into that, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being uh, throwing topics and topics at you. Do you think it's going to be, or at least has the potential to, let's say, talk about distal and proximal hypertrophy, which could be of interest for a bodybuilder? Yeah, we definitely need more research to see if the hypertrophy benefits of length and partials are mostly concentrated in one or different part of the muscle, for example, distal hypertrophy. There may be a chance that, especially in some muscles, in some situations, you get more growth with length and partials, but much of that growth is in a, just a part of the muscle. Much of the research I've seen so far seems to show that that's the case, but also a lot of uh, the research shows that it actually seems like really the whole muscle is doing just fine or the whole muscle is growing about as good as it ever would plus you get an additional distal growth whereas if you do uh, shortened partials then you get similar growth for the shortened part for the proximal part of the muscle but worse growth for the distal part so on the net balance there may be some biasing effect of length and partials to some extent to the distal hypertrophy, but the overall effect is so great that there's no part of the muscle that you're missing out on that's getting smaller. I'll say another thing. Most muscles uh, aesthetically improve if they're distally hypertrophied. You don't want your bicep close to your shoulder. You want it bigger that way. You want your tricep to bulge out lower, not up here. You want your quads to sweep really low close to your knee. That makes them look way bigger than if they're big up top. It makes you look like you have fat hips. Um, so with, with a few exceptions, generally the bias towards the part of the muscle that's distal is actually a very welcome thing. Uh, how that research is going to unfold in depth over the next few years is not predictable. I, I'm not willing to make a prediction on it. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah. Now, the good news is we have science that we don't have to make predictions. We just watch what the science does and we go, oh, okay, that's what's going on. So it's curious. Um, another thing is when the length and partials literature came out, um, I was curious and reserved because you don't want to get too excited about a study or two. There's, that's how you clown yourself. Um, what I, what I was not was surprised. Why? Because when we talk about full ROM, when we 
practice full ROM training. We have a few uh, tenets which we use for almost all technique. One of them is to control the eccentric, and I can speak to that to some extent. One is to go really kind of as deep as possible, the biggest, gnarliest, painful stretch that you can get. Potentially even pausing down there at the bottom to really milk that stretch out. So milking the stretch is the huge deal to us as we practice full ROM uh, at, at Renaissance periodization. Peak contraction and the squeeze at the top was never a big part of what we were preaching. In some exercises, it seems like it's doing some good. It's um, uh, definitely ASMR-wise, it feels comfortable to do. It feels pleasant. Like really arching at the top of a row and crunching your back back there. It seems it feels neat. And it gives you um, a sort of methodological completeness. You know you completed a rep when you can crunch at the top of the rep. But uh, we didn't really very much overly emphasize that. Like you'll see people doing pull-ups where they hold the pull-up at the top and then go down. And we're usually like, yeah, that's cool. And it's amazing that you can do that. Not, not so much positive that there's a lot happening there when you hold the pull-up at the top. It's hard, but maybe like, you know, definitely, I tell you what, if I saw a guy that was getting a full stretch on his squats, but coming up two thirds of the way in the gym, in a squat, then I saw another guy who was getting a full peak contraction in the squat and the squats at the top, but only going down two thirds of the way. The first guy who gets a deep stretch, I'd be like, that guy's definitely doing this better. And one, one of the ways we came to that conclusion was just a lot of experience where if you get nasty, painful stretches, you get way bigger pumps, you get way more soreness, way more perturbation. Your muscles are more likely to cramp and get really fatigued and feel really strange. And seemingly those all correlate to growth as well. So yes, full ROM was the case all the time, but we were always much more interested in the deep stretch. Uh, another thing is most of the people we work with and through Jared Feather, we work with a lot of IFBB pros on the YouTube channel. We have them on, we sort of show them how we train and have them go through a workout. We almost never have to make a point to make them get a better peak contraction. Almost always have to make a point to get them a bigger stretch. And you know, pros have been talking about peak contractions for a while. They, they, you know, the bicep, yeah, fucking milk it out. And it, it might have its uses. I can get into those in a bit. But um, generally, most people avoid the deep, painful stretch. And it is a hilarious irony, maybe very serendipitous, in fact, that that's where most of the growth is. It doesn't seem like you can get away from discomfort. It's almost a rule that your body grows from discomfort. So if someone's like, hey, is it heavy weight that grows you? You're like, uh, if you go close to failure, like what about high reps? If you go close to failure, what about short rest breaks? If you go close to failure, what about long rest breaks? Well, if you do the mechanical work and then the more of it you do, the better it gets. Like, oh, but mechanical work is hard. Like, okay, well, how else can I hack the system? Like, you can go get painful, super deep, crazy, psychotic stretches, and you're like, oh, fuck. It's just all bad news. So if you follow the pain, you're probably going to get some pretty good hints as to what grows muscle. Yeah. So based on that understanding, we already had, when the research came out on length and partials, I was initially skeptical, as I am today skeptical and always will be skeptical. Skeptical is a philosophical position, not as a position of cynicism. A lot of people think skeptical and cynical are the same thing. They're not remotely the same thing. Skeptical to the extent of like, well, like uh, there's always a trend with a few folks, a few studies will come out, one or two, and it'll be like, oh my God, this is the new thing. Uh, high intensity interval training. I actually have a video today uh, about the V-Shred, the V-Shred critique on YouTube. And he talks about, uh, you know, hit training. And like I said in the video, it's 20 years out of date. We used to think for a few studies that, that HIIT training was this amazing way to save a ton of time, but then burn a ton of calories later, and it was this huge hack. And then multiple other studies came out, and it was like, nah, it actually doesn't really do that. And then now it's like, okay, miss, list, and HIIT are all fine modalities to do for cardio, just uh, situationally dependent. So I'm trying to be careful not to over-index on length and partials, be like, oh, that's it. This is the way that you need to train forever. Fuck the last... Uh, you know, half of the range of motion. It's stupid. It's a waste of time. And I would say that might be true. But from now, my default hypothesis before this research came out was full range of motion. Here is only lengthened partials at the bottom 10 degrees. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've moved right here. 
here ish. So now anytime I do an exercise or teach an exercise, I'm more keen to emphasize spending more time in the stretched position, architecting the exercise to be more stretch loaded. Uh, for example, if you curl with the cable stack in front of you, you know, not much happens at the bottom and a lot happens at the top. But if you turn around and do Bayesian curls, Mano Henselman curls, you know, stretching behind you, when you to be like experientially I knew those fucked me up more but I thought well variations good I'll use the other curls but now that we have really good data on the fact that like oh wow actually the stretch works better I'm more inclined to choose exercises that are more stretch mediated more inclined to milk the stretch out of those exercises more inclined to modify machines to give me a better stretch more inclined to spend more time in the stretch position so two or three second bottom pauses a really slow descent into the bottom part of the bench press versus kind of a fast rocket back up and uh, I'm extra less worried than usual, less concerned than usual about the top of the concentric portion. So like in a lat pull down, if it touches my chest, I count that as a rep. Does it have to like touch and stay there? No. Do I have to crutch my back? No. That seems to not matter much. Uh, for a while I was like, okay, should I do uh, pull-ups where I pull to the chin or should I do pull-ups where I pull to the sternum or the clavicles? And now based on that literature, I'm inferring that, you know, sorry, uh, based on that literature, I'm inferring that, you know, if I just get my chin to the bar, that's like a good pull up. And it's funny now because, you know, like I'll post almost all my training on uh, Instagram and every now and again, people will be like cheating those pull ups. And I'm like, oh, how? And they're like, you're not getting your chest up to the bar. And I'm like, why should I get my chest up to the bar? And they, you know, they don't have any reasons for it. They're just some kind of like attachment to full ROM for its own sake, which is a big, big problem and a problem I'm not interested in committing. So there is, I assure everyone, no dogmatic attachment to full range of motion. If yeah. the evidence keeps being clear that length and partials are superior in every conceivable way, you will see me start modifying my training incrementally more to focusing on the lengthened portion of the repetition and incrementally less focus on the top end. So now you touch a lot of interesting uh, sub questions that I have for you. And one of the first that comes to mind is the SFR. Let's let's say pull ups. I think pull ups is a good example. The last bit of the pull up when you perhaps you're touching with your chin or with your sternum, I think it can drastically change well, or well at least significantly change the SFR and also the proximity to failure. Because let's say you cannot go up, 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 but perhaps up to this point, you can maybe squeeze two, three more reps and also change the proximity to failure, which I think it's one of the interesting points to have to, or at least have in mind when training and choosing um, the range of motion that you're gonna use in that particular movement. And also the other question that I had for you, how to standardize? Because for some people, the the, the main critique that goes for length and partials, it's when to stop, when, what, is, what constitutes a rep. So I wanted to ask firstly about the SFR. Do you think it has changed for you in several exercises now that you don't need perhaps to squeeze the top end of a, of a pull-up in, in, a, in a different note of maybe just focusing more on the stretch? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are definitely exercises which I have seen improved SFR in focusing more on the stretch and less on the contraction. One of them is calf raises. So that peak contraction at the top, like it's cool, but uh, uh, if you get a deep stretch and come back only halfway up and go back down, I've noticed that my calves just get predictably more sore for the same number of sets and uh, they get better pumps. And I'm like, okay, well, this is fucking sweet. And um, so that I definitely have noticed. I think that's been uh, a bit of a change. What was your second question? The first one was about SFR. The second was SFR, about the second tracking. Was tracking. Tracking, yeah. The, what is a yeah. rep when you're talking about length yeah. portions? I mean, I think it's not so hard to figure out what is a rep. You just need to set a standard for yourself. So you need to say, okay, you know, on the bench press, I'm going to come down when my arms are like at, you know, whatever, let's say 120 degree angle and then come back down as opposed to a full lockout. And then it just comes down to honesty with yourself about what it, when, it, when is failure, when, it, when I cannot come up to 120. And there I would say I use a, an interesting system. Uh, you can call it, this is a two-step system. 
you know roughly where you think failure should be. Your last repetition that you did, you might have not gone high enough, right? So you think, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Um, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I, I can hit that range of motion again. So the two-step system really just says, try again. And if you fail, if you for sure don't go as high as you thought you were supposed to, yeah, that's failure. So a lot of times just using a two-step system and a very rough landmark can get you a considerable degree of accuracy, definitely enough to track if you're honest. If you're a beginner, if you're not so honest with yourself, yeah, length and partials make tracking really fucking hard because there's no, it's very easy to tell when you've come all the way back up in a movement. Now, length and partials, many of the times, especially properly force curved, aren't very difficult to track because there is a distinct, you're only going to fail in that hardest position. For example, the squat. If you come up roughly two thirds of the way up, you know you're close to failure because you won't get out of the hole. <laughs> it's not going to be like, oh, like I can go higher. No, no, the going higher part's easy. So you can really go just about as high as you need to. Another thing is tracking is great, but two things about tracking. One is that it needs to be pretty precise, but not overly precise. There are some people that are very concerned about tracking to the point of like, well, did your elbows look like this or did they lock out? See that like that or like that, like that or like that. And they will perseverate on this for hours on end, searching forums, critiquing other people's videos. I would say with very charitable and being very snarky today on this Friday morning, Friday afternoon. Uh, but uh, most of those people are just exhibiting traits of mental illness. Like you're just not well, uh, seriously, not a joke. Like you're just very neurotic and very, very OCD. Like take this from a neurotic OCD Jew like myself. I feel you. I know exactly what you're thinking. There is some, when, when this is here, when this clicks into place, there's some magical degree of, yes, it clicks. It's the right answer. It's either one or zero. Mike Menser, Ayn Rand, I get it, I get it. Yeah, yeah. But you don't need to go nuts about it. You need to understand that tracking can be done with a limited but very useful degree of precision where the two-step method is really good because it's like, oh, did I hit it? I don't know. Did I hit it now? Yes, keep going. Did I hit it now? No, okay, I'm done. So tracking's not that difficult. And this is a point I think Milo has made pretty well himself. Like tracking is a problem. But it's a tractable problem. The other thing is this. How important is tracking versus the imposition of a proper stimulus? So for example, you, um, you let's say, uh, you're, I'll just give the worst analogy ever. How about that? Is that okay? It's perfectly fine. Man. Okay, great. So uh, you- just, I'm horrible, I hope we don't get flagged out again. Oh, oh we're gonna get flagged. Did I, we get I flagged last time? No, no, I don't think so. Man. But I did see your thumbnail with the <laughs> thing in your mouth. And I was, was like, oh, here comes, here comes trouble, man. <laughs> but anyway, the go Insta ahead. Instagram, the Instagram police got us. So if okay. you are, uh, you're on a date with a beautiful girl, right? Let's even say a beautiful Mexican girl. Oh, like sure, Jared Feather is probably on a date like that right now. So uh, let's say that you get home or whatever and she's like, you know, whatever. She's like, ay, Dios mío. Uh, what is it? Uh, how do you say, uh, uh, touch me? Um, let's put it in sexy words. You would say, oh, papi, por favor, tócame. Tócame. Tócame ahora. And she would, um, all right. she, she would point the... Oh, sorry. yeah. Oh, yeah, my man. You've had, five, I'm sure, no, no oh, yeah. doubt, lots of experience. So, had my share. Had my share. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and she's like, all right, do me. Like, whatever. She's like, tócame. And you're like, let's do it. And then you're like having sex in a certain position, right? And she's like, hey, flip me over and do me this other way. And you're like, I can't do that. And she's like, por qué? Why not? And you're like, um, I count my strokes. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, right? And I can't count from that other position. It just like confuses oh. me. It's off, right? <laughs> and then she's like, okay. It turns out she's a philosopher. And she's like, Let, time out, time out, time out, time out. You're, you get your dick out. She's like, all right, all right, all right. what's more important to you? Tracking the number of strokes or giving me a fucking orgasm, you asshole. 
And you're like, ah, I guess the only purpose of us being here is that sex should be fun. That's the whole point of sex is everyone's having fun. So if you're willing to throw away the fun because it's difficult to track, you have a very deep, deep philosophical problem as to what you're doing. And so this is something that Milo Wolf and uh, Dr. Pack made a very excellent point on a podcast we were on once. Tracking is important, but if you are for the purpose of tracking, not using an effective strategy like length and partials that is more effective than full ROM, then you're saying tracking is more important than getting the results. Wait, 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 hold on a sec. But why are you tracking? You're tracking results, you dumb motherfucker. So it, it's like uh, this insane, insane practice where we take the good thing and because it has a little problem, you go, I can't do this. Right, it, it, it's similar to seeing a really hot girl who's interested in you, and you're like, "Oh, she looks amazing," and you're like, oh, "Are you gonna ask her out?" You're like, nah, "I don't like her hat," and you're like, "What? That is a surmountable problem." You're like, ah, that's too much. So, yes, tracking is important, but if we have decent tracking, and the return on investment is we have an excellent, better stimulus with length and partials, it's worth it to no longer be able to track uh, in a way that is obsessive compulsive and perfectionist and precise. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, for real. And I think the term, I think it's coined by, by Milo, it's training hygiene. We're just supposed <laughs> to just, yeah, for sure. Man. I, I, I've heard it from him. I don't know if he took it sure. from so It's a good term. Else. <laughs> yeah. If you're able to just track your progress in a given range of motion, well, that's sufficient enough because I've seen it happen. I've seen this change in paradigm from people the bros, the typical bros that you can have in mind, and then to the neurotic type of gym rats that go all the way down, let's say a squat, all the way up, and if something changes in between, if every rep it's not exactly the same, it's a failure. Mm -hmm. They get stressed out, they think they're not progressing, and I, I get where you're going at. It's, it's really not a problem at all, because I've been there too, uh, spe specifically with the, with the pull-ups, with the pull-up example. Mm -hmm. If I didn't touch, with my chin in the bar, it's a failure of a set, and you know, it kind of gets stressful. And I think it's not for no benefit at all, for no benefit that end of the, the, the last, mm, let's say, range of motion, mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the stretch and just standardizing in a range, not in a fixed, I don't know, position, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So at some point, it's, uh, yeah, tracking is great. And we want to seek to be as precise in our tracking as is reasonable. But on a reasonable degree, precision is unreasonable. And the net balance is a bad deal for us. So we should rethink that. Yeah, the last, the, the next thing I wanted to ask you, we don't have data for every muscle group. And there's a study which is not designed to, designed to answer this particular question but it's the squats versus hip thrust study for the development of the glutes. I wanted to ask what's your take on this. Let's say for glutes, we might think that perhaps the shortening position on the load, it's important. But when you compare it to the lengthening position on the load, let's say with a squat, as according to that study, you practically get the same growth. Do you think it's worth focusing on both the lengthening and the shortening for some muscle groups? Or maybe it's just a full serum. It's a good question. I have a different interpretation of that study. Please, man. Here's how powerful the lengthened position is. That it got the same growth in an exercise, the squat, which is primarily targeting the hamstrings. and also robustly trains the adductors and robustly trains the glutes and the lower back all at the same time. That exercise, which mostly trains the quads, gives you an unreal amount of quad hypertrophy. And just as a side effect, because of the length and position of the glutes, it also grows them as much as an exercise, the hip thrust, tailored exclusively to hit the glutes. So that's like if you have two martial arts you're comparing, one martial art, does wrestling, jiu-jitsu, striking, and another martial art just only striking, and the guys fight each other from the two martial arts, and the guy who does all three ties on score to the guy who only does striking, that other 
that is way fucking better. <laughs> Whatever it is he's doing training striking, let's say they're genetically identical twins that train as much time with each other. Whatever striking method he's using in his combination training is superior to the striking method used with a guy only striking because he trains a third of the time for it, but gets all the benefits. So I see the squat glute study as a gigantic, if anything, if we want to extrapolate out of it, as a gigantic win for the lengthened position because with an exercise legitimately not designed to target the glutes, you get better results. I, I, I'm just teeming with anticipation for someone to complain, to compare hip thrusts to uh, front foot elevated lunges. I predict the front foot elevated lunges will cause a significant higher amount of hypertrophy than hip thrusts. But we didn't need formal science to tell us that because almost everyone has the same experience with hip thrusts. You do them, you do a lot of them, you have to put a lot of weight on the bar, you know, let's get a good pump. There's some feeling in there, but they don't really ever really get sore or super tired or super perturbed. With exercises like front foot elevated lunges, for example, which are designed to preferentially target the glutes, your glutes, you can get what, what, I, what I jokingly call IOMs, uh, instantaneous onset muscle soreness. You ever had that from walking lunges? Where you like, have, you do I, one I set, yeah, and you're like, holy shit, the fuck happened to my glutes? They hurt already. And you try to contract them and they cramp. You're like, oh, holy shit, you got to sit down or lay down and even know what to do. That doesn't really happen almost ever from hip thrusts. So from the in stimulus proxies that we have that are indirect, we can tell things like front foot elevated lunges are just superior to hip thrusts because they mechanically place the glute at an enormous stretch. So that all being said, is there a place for hip thrusts and glute training? There is a place for hip thrusts and glute training in at least three ways that I can think of. One is it might be good to do some hip thrusts, though maybe not curtailing your whole program around them, or sorry, uh, organizing your whole program around them. There might be some value to that in a completeness perspective. So maybe some kind of glute growth you get from hip thrusts you don't get from anywhere. It's a small amount, but it makes your glutes more complete. I can believe that. Sure. Another way we can use hip thrusts intelligently is if you individually seem to have a huge response from them, like you just have a huge pump, huge soreness, you make great progress. Hey, awesome. Never going to tell you not to use an exercise that clearly works for you. Another one is variation. You know, like you can't do front foot elevated lunges for forever, man. And then hip thrusts are a decent exercise. And sometimes you do them for a few months, especially when they're novel, maybe in a superset, then they can be very effective to that regard. And there's probably a few different other ways in which glute thrusts can be an effective exercise. And we, we or hip thrusts, whatever you call them, same thing. Um, this all kind of ends up being a problem only for people who are looking for the one best exercise, which actually we have an RP podcast coming out Monday that should try to dispel that myth entirely. But, uh, you know, there is not one superior exercise. It doesn't exist and it actually cannot exist. Um, it, it can, I'll say this, uh, here's a here's fun, fun times for analogies today. One best exercise is as impossible of a thing as the one hottest girl to a, a average heterosexual guy. Like yeah, today, you're the hottest girl. Tomorrow, I see a picture of someone else and I'm on her shit. Like variety is the flavor of the month, right? So because variation exists, we don't have to say, nope, it's only squats, never again a hip thrust. There is absolutely room for hip thrust. But if we prior to this series of studies and this length and partial thing thought that hip thrusts were some kind of optimized for the glutes, then we may be in a situation where we could be mistaken. Last thing I'll say, there is absolutely a way to design a hip thrust that would make it theoretically very, very effective for glute training. Because the hip thrust does have a big advantage. It really lets you isolate the glutes and it lets so you have a big mind muscle connection with the glutes. I mean, for the love of God, that's what a hip thrust is, is you just flexing your fucking glutes. Very difficult to do a hip thrust for some weeks at a time and not really feel like, oh, okay, wow, there's my glutes. So, and the lunge is great, but it requires balance and it's kind of off center. It's kind of weird. Um, if you devise a mechanical system, a machine, let's say, that has a hip thrust apparatus, but the force curve is such that at the bottom of the hip thrust, it imposes by far the most tension. And as you rise up, it actually imposes less and less tension. 
you may be able to architect the glute thrust, the hip thrust into like a superior glute exercise because you're getting that stretch under load. It's with, it's uh, two legs at the same time, you really connect with that mind muscle connection. And because it's going to be so much easier at the top, you could do that top hip pop where you really flex your glutes together and then mind muscle connection into your glutes. Okay. I know where my glutes are. I know I'm using them. And then as you lower into that eccentric, you'll be able to have the glutes do much of the resisting because they're the most active muscle. So the, the hip thrust is an amazing exercise. The force curve is just all wrong. And the only way you can make it worse is doing it with a band, which is, makes it even worse. And really <laughs> so popular too. very popular, but it's exactly as popular as it is, not as effective as it could be. So. In defense of the hip thrust, I think one of the cool aspects of that particular movement at least for girls, as I've seen in my own experience, it's that it lets them know that they can be strong, they can put plates on the bar and get stronger and focus on getting stronger, instead of just maybe doing um, hip extensions and feeling just the good working there, but not focusing on getting stronger. So that's, for me, one point for the hip thrust. But honestly, man, I think it's a little bit overrated when you think, like you mentioned, as the best exercise for glutes because, well, as you also mentioned, variety is the, the flavor of the day, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My man, yeah. talking about programming considerations, uh, just to finish up the conversation, and you already alluded to it, let's say you do, you focus on the lengthened portion. Um, we know that it's gonna cause a little bit more damage, perhaps much more damage. How do you tend to program these movements and which movements and also for which muscle groups? Because that's one, we, one thing we don't really know from the, the, the science of it. Does it lengthen partials apply to all muscle groups? Perhaps it does, but we don't have the data for it. So how do you personally program for this if you include them in a program? I, I program them exactly like I would any other exercise. I start at a very low volume exactly like I would with every other exercise. And then using recovery time courses and stimulus to fatigue proxies, I regulate the volume appropriately. And to be honest, I don't even do that anymore because the RPI hypertrophy app does all that automatically. So if I just put in a custom exercise that says length and partials for whatever triceps, and then I do that, the app understands based on your feedback, how much stimulus you're getting and how much fatigue and then it upregulates or downregulates the number of sets that you're doing. So same as any other exercise. Yeah, no, no change at all. Um, you know, I would, I would also recommend that anyone who does an exercise for the first time ever, especially one that's considered very, very stimulative, I'd say it's a good idea to start with fewer sets than you think you might need. And look, if you don't feel anything that day, add more sets. But chances are, like, if you do, like, front foot elevated lunges, which really are kind of a loaded partial if you think about it, uh, you, the first time you do them, after one set, you may be like, oh, my God, my glutes. And just stop. Just go home. Um, you'll recover on time, and the next time maybe you'll do two sets or something like that. Do you use partials like that in your training or just the modifications that, that you mentioned? I do it with calves. I do only train length and partials for my calves now. Um, I do with some biceps movements. Uh, so instead of bringing it up to here, I'll bring it up to here or something like that. Um, yeah, this, not offhand, but there's definitely a few other movements where I've been incorporating what you would technically call a length and partial, sure. I think that's interesting in a philosophical way, like you mentioned um, in the conversation a little earlier on, that it's not about ideology. I'm not here to defend partials or full ROM as neither are you or Milo. It's just in, in the face of this current research that it happens to be really interesting and not a fad and has mechanistic data that also it's interesting. Perhaps we can modify a little bit of training to get better results. And in Milo's words, perhaps you're not going to get um, significantly greater results. There's a potential that it's a tiny bit better than full range of motion in certain circumstances. So I think that's one of the, for me at least, the most important takeaways about this whole uh, length and partial discussion. Yeah, absolutely. People will get dogmatic about almost anything they can. And um, dog dogma is usually a bad idea. Now, dogma has a utility. The utility of dogma is that for people unable or, or unwilling to process justifications in their cognitive bandwidth, dogma from someone they trust can be a very low, 
low mental bandwidth way to exert a practice that you think is beneficial. For example, uh, let's take the Bible. Why not? And the Bible. Go on, okay. Evelyn. I mean, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll say only nice things. Here comes trouble. <laughs> uh, very trouble. So you know the Bible, Ten Commandments and shit. It says like, well, thou thou shalt not kill or whatever, right? Now, now that's technically dogma. Literally, it is, provides no justification for why you shouldn't kill. God said it, so you should just shut up and do it. And here's the thing: like, what if you started thinking about it? Well, so why why shalt not you thou shalt not kill? Is why is that a good idea? And uh, depending on your knowledge of evolutionary psychology depending on your knowledge of uh, political architecture or systems theory, second order effects, you may actually tend to conclude that in many situations, killing is totally fine. It would be the wrong conclusion because if you knew all those things I just talked about, you would conclude that killing another human being is almost always a really terrible idea. But you're not a fucking evolutionary psychologist. You're not a fucking nerd like me who did years of reading to figure all this shit out. As a matter of fact, some of the stuff we didn't even know but 50 years ago. Definitely didn't know a lot of it 100 years ago. And 2,000 years ago or whatever-ish when the Bible came around, I mean, fuck, man, we knew almost none of it. So dogma has a really, really good utility of being like, just shut up and take this advice. It's good advice. And go, okay, I believe. And that's it. So it has a utility, so I understand why almost everyone is inclined to be dogmatic because it's just a, a space-saving device in your brain. But nowadays, with evidence-based shit, we don't necessarily have to be dogmatic anymore because you can listen to nuance and say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, maybe I'll try it this way. And I can also say that there's maybe a mild use of dogma that's sort of beneficial in like a halfway dogma, which means that you do some research and you do some reading and maybe you just like... Um, come to the conclusion that this practice I'm doing, let's say full ROM, this is a good practice. I'm convinced by it. And what you say to yourself is like, unless I get very convincing evidence to change my views, I won't. Why? Because what I'm doing is good enough. It seems like a great thing. And I'm not just going to change every day one way or the other. It's going to cost too much cognitive bandwidth for me to, to slap off. So what you can say is like, okay, I'm not doing length and partials. And then three years after, after the research is very clear that you should be doing it, that a bunch of people are doing it beneficially, you go, okay, I'll start length and partials. Then you're just being playing a conservative game. You're not, you're missing out on a little bit, but you're not missing out on much because you have a dogma, but it's a soft dogma. So it's like, I'm going to really need some convincing to show me that some other way is true. And I'm not going to be this purely scientific person that's always floating in the mystery. But at the end of the day, you go to the gym, you can't have a lot of mystery. Like you got to know what you're going to do for that exercise right now. And if you're not a fucking nerd and you don't need to spend all of your time doing research on exercise, then some simple things like always use a full range of motion can be like 95% of the way to the truth. The other 5% is, and in many contexts, length and partials could offer some superiority. You're like, oh, what the fuck is that? You don't need to know. Just do full range of motion. And maybe we can tell you full range of motion, especially accentuating that deep stretch. Hey, now we're 98, 99% of the way to the truth. And so for a lot of people, you know, this whole like, oh, it's no dogma, like it's okay to have a little bit of dogma if it has a good utility to you. But just try to understand that don't make dogma emotional and personal because a lot of people will do that with everything. They'll say, oh my God, you're doing sets of 12? Like you're an idiot. And you're like, holy shit, how did we get this far? So it's cool to have some views that you're not willing to change just for any reason at all. But always remember that, uh, okay, well, we can do a little bit better uh, than, you know, pure dogma and some mental flexibility is probably a good idea. I think this, there's a Richard Feynman quote that goes something like, keep your mind open, but not so open that your brain falls off. I yeah. think it's really important to have that in mind, uh, ironically, because in social media, you can see these discussions about, let's say, full ROM, partials, about high volume, low volume, high intensity, you know, all the stuff. And in nutrition is no exception. And I think with the more access we have to information and science, the less people develop their own personal critical thinking and their own personal, let's say, way of approaching, how's the word? Let's say engaging in this, in this particular information because it's complex. Science is really complex and that's why we need people that 
give us all the nuance like you do and other other people in the in the field like let's say Helms and all of them and for some reason it's really difficult to understand to some extent for the majority of people that it's not ideology when we talk about training about nutrition yeah. just to, as, a, as a final note what advice could you give people that are in this dance of not knowing what information to to hold on to and what how to identify people that go with this black and white beliefs yeah <clears throat> if anyone is too dogmatic they're probably not an intelligent way uh they're not an intelligent choice to follow. You know, if they're like, I'm super correct that everyone's a fucking idiot. There's a probability that they're correct and everyone's an idiot, but that probability is very low. So you want people to give you a little bit more of a measured take, you know, like if you read the mass research review, it's all measured takes very few finalities, very few absolute statements. So that's very good. You also want to take advice from people grounded in the reality of the situation. You know, there are people giving advice on hypertrophy training that seemingly don't train for hypertrophy. And so their uh, ecological experience with hypertrophy training is either very low or just, just not in evidence at all. And so you can absolutely should take some of their advice. But if you have low bandwidth and you can only follow so many people's advice, you know, they are not high on the list of people you want to keep around. And... Um, other than that, you know, you, you, the last thing I would say is make sure that whatever advice you're following concords with logical examination as you see it and your experience. Like if, if uh, we tell people, hey, listen, like full ROM is really good on a leg press, especially that deep stretch. If you start uh, trying it, most of the time you're going to be like, oh my God, my quads are fucked up. Or like, of course this is better. But if we said something else instead, like, well, actually the top eighth of the range of motion, you know, like right here, that's what you should do. You try to be like, my knees hurt a lot and nothing really happened to my legs. I don't know if this is right. So you should definitely practice things yourself and find out, is this piece of advice that this evidence-based or whatever person giving me, does it seem to be practically panning out in any way that I can imagine? And if it, if it does, then amazing. Uh, if it, doesn't then uh, it looks like you got to think about it a little bit more you know so uh, that's kind of at least some of the wisdom i can share on that that's awesome man i gotta say the comment section on here it's been crazy this morning you have a really interesting following i've seen a lot of jokes oh my god don't 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 you associate do not associate so, me with so fucking yeah, but... degenerates <laughs> Let me make a statement real quick. I don't know any of these people. They're all degenerates. They, uh, they're they terrible people with no friends, no home. Oh. And they don't even have parents, I don't think. All these people are just like, they're, uh, they're, there's the Russian bot, Russian bot, internet troll. That's it, man. Those are not real people. We don't pay attention but you, to them. But you've got to admit, some, some of them are, like, are kind of funny. They're funny. No, the funny oh, none of, of them are funny. Let's, let's see, scroll. <laughs> let's see, scroll. I'm going to scroll for a joke. Let's see. Greg Pitt Continuity, a, an account named after a, uh, a, a Greg Pitt, kind of, named after a dead man, says, yeah, that... whoa, you go gay for Daddy Mike, no punchline. There's two guys arguing, no punchline, <laughs> uh, no punchline, no punchline. Uh -huh. I don't see any comedy in here, motherfucker. I'm <laughs> playing with you guys. You guys know I'm playing with you. Oh, they don't take it personal, man. They all love you. We There's love no you. one there to take it personally. There's no human beings in the comments section. <laughs> They're just bots. <laughs> bots on, on all the spirit bots. of Mr. Greg Plitt. May God rest his soul. <laughs> yeah, my, I, did, I shouldn't have laughed like, at that as hard as I did. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, if we, get, we, we don't get flagged for this one, I think that's going to be a victory for both science <laughs> yeah, and for philosophy. Sure. And perhaps comedy too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me interrupt. Yeah, this. Yeah. Interrupt. this is, this is the <laughs> sense of humor dealing with this. One guy, Joseph B.O., nice name, Joseph, was uh, actually just commented, punchline. Joseph. <laughs> My man. Let's give it up for Joe. Joe, when uh, you're man. swimming in vaginas later today, try not to drown. He's a man with your sense of humor, I'm sure gets it from left and right. Leave something for the rest of us, my man. <laughs> That's what we don't get any. Oh, look Joe, that. just kidding. You're the man. Thanks for commenting. If I didn't shit on my followers every now and again, what kind of rich Lamborghini driving asshole would I be? 
Yeah, for real, man. I think each conversation that we had over the years, you have like two, three Lamborghinis extra. So thank you. Naming so, for that. And I, I, I thank you so much. I, I, I like to, I'm a very big supporter of an extraction economy. So any amount of money I can get from Mexicans, since the GDP is lower than America, it's even better because maybe it makes Mexico poor somehow. I really love it when there's like the rich that have castles and then just poor people starving. It's what I'm and trying I, to go for. Unfortunately, Mexico has been getting richer uh, all the time. I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm not a fan of other people getting richer, only me. No, don't sweat it, man. I, I've lived here my whole life, and I can tell you <laughs> poverty, it's right next door. So I can confirm any time, man. Just, just ask me, and I'll tell you, hey, how's, how's poverty in Mexico? But it's still, it's still going <laughs> strong. <man>. It's still <laughs> good. You know, yeah, I'm from Russia. How's poverty over there? Much worse than Oh, that. shit, uh, man. I, I got to say, um, I like that you're trying to calm me down. But I will say, um, you look like very well put together, and your apartment looks very nice. I'm not, I'm not like that. I don't. I'm not. Uh, you're kind of scaring me. You're kind of doing well. Filters. I don't like other people doing it's well. All it's all filters. filters. It's all yeah. It's integral filters. When you see me in person, you're gonna go, oh, there's Mexican oh. person. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sombrero and the whole thing. Like every stereotype. Yeah, team. we get those. <laughs> but you know what's the funny thing about Mexico? We tend to get angry at those stereotypes. But we're not exactly <laughs> we're not exactly politically correct uh, with with other people, as you say. So oh, I can feel. If you come to Mexico, Mexico, you might see some of that. Man. Let let me. Uh, I'm going to go to Mexico and ask how many of the people there are super excited about your like Central Americans coming up to live in Mexico. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a tricky one. <laughs> not, not talking about myself, of course. Of course but not. I, but, of course, but I know, but I know my people. <laughs> yes. My man, Dr. Mike, always a pleasure. It's been super insightful, full of comedy also, and also philosophy, which I also happen to love with the discussions. And also, though, I don't know if you uploaded more videos on that on those topics, but I think it's pretty cool that you did that, man, talking about philosophy and other stuff. Oh, thanks so much. Fitness, because, yeah, for real, man, I think it's more... There's a lot more to be said and learned than just the scientific side of things. Sure, sure. Hey, do you want to see something scary really quick? For sure. Really scary. Well, scary. Well, I think so. Oh, come on, man. That's not scary at all. That's. Look at those teeth. Who got teeth? <laughs> Who got the teeth? Oh, my God. We're How so old is she now? How old is she? That's She's uh, two, I think, two years old. Two years old. That's a, that's a damn cute dog, let me say. Oh, we love her. She's only killed like five people. It's barely any, and none of them were rich, so no, nobody lost, really. I was going to ask if those were Mexican uh, victims, but I don't want to get in trouble, man. <laughs> That's really, I, mean, I wasn't yeah, going to yeah. say that. Nah, you were uh, going to, uh, man. <laughs> yes. For the record, right. just in case anyone thinks any of us are serious, I've been to Mexico a trillion times. I fucking love Mexico. I love Mexicans, and Jared Feather really, really loves Mexicans. Yeah, yeah, that kind of seems to be the case man i also love mexico i mean i live here i, I don't have any options but i do love mexico <laughs> i don't have any country. options daniel you should have never <laughs> said that last part i can't leave but <laughs> but it's i i'm not legally allowed to leave but it's a it's really nice country man anytime you want to come you know your mother was <laughs> yahoo <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's exciting, right? We're getting canceled. We're getting canceled for sure. That uh, was it. It, it was going to happen sooner or later, so better sooner than yep. later. Yep. Right? Yep. yep, there you go. So, Mike, I hope you have a great rest of the day. I hope we can have a little more of this discussion because I always learn a lot and enjoy a lot talking to you, man. So, thanks a lot for taking the time. Thank you so much, man. I'll talk to you later. Always welcome, man.